Welcome to twoquestions.tv. With me today is Steve Hoffman, and we're talking about radical innovation. Welcome to twoquestions.tv. I'm Susan Barangini Mo. Joining me today is Steve Hoffman. He's the captain and CEO of Founderspace, one of the top incubators and accelerators in the world. He's been a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, angel investor, mobile studio head, computer engineer, filmmaker, Hollywood TV exec, game designer, animator, and voice actor. He's done it all. He's also the author of this book, Make Elephants Fly, The Process of Radical Innovation, and we're talking about that today. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the show. I'm super excited to be here. Me too. And we were just talking about Stuart Brand yeah. viewers. If you don't know who Stuart Brand is, you should Google him right now. <laughs> More catalog. I know you have a copy. I, oh, ooh, uh, shall I show it? You shall. <laughs> I shall. Here it is. The whole Earth yeah. catalog. The last one. It's so exciting. Yes. It's a collector's item. <laughs> I know. So cool. Well, okay. So, so your book, uh, Steve, your book was fantastic. I loved Thank it. Thank you. And it's officially now required reading for my entrepreneur coaching clients who are looking oh. for their next thing. <laughs> yes. They need to read your book, not just to understand the very practical parts, like of how to in the innovation and good basic research. And also you even touched on some of what I call that brain junk piece. Um, but, but also I felt like just reading the book as you're reading, it inspires some really interesting ideas. Like Thank it inspires you. innovation. So, so, um, you said in the book, um, how do you know if you have a real problem to solve? You ask other people and if they get as frustrated as you do, you can eliminate their pain. And that's how you start to reinvent a category. In particular, you talk about the inventive ecosystem and you say the lone inventor is a myth. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So we all have this vision of the lone inventor who sits there by herself or himself <laughs> and toils away and comes up with some genius idea out of nowhere. Light bulbs above their head. Yeah, a light bulb. <laughs> Thomas Edison, you know, <laughs> working. So Thomas Edison, he was a great myth maker um, and likes people to believe all these things like he never slept and he did <laughs> Own and he, all these things, you know, he had a big lab, he had people working he for him, did. sleep under his desk during the day, <laughs> working, they'd come into his lab, he'd be asleep just because he worked all night. Um, and he didn't invent a lot of things he invented. So a lot of things he actually innovated on other people's inventions. And so most, let's, first of all, let me talk about the difference, which most people do not understand between invention and innovation. Right. Now, everybody thinks, uh, you know, it, entrepreneurs are supposed to go out there and invent new technology and, you know, change the world, right? That's, that's the myth we all live. <laughs> but in reality, entrepreneur, you know, inventing a new core technology. I'm not about, I'm not talking about inventing a new coat hanger, right? You can do that on your own. You can be the lone inventor and you can go and create a new coat hanger. You know, you have the materials. It's not that hard. But if you want to invent a new core technology like the, you know, transistor or, you know, the internet or any of these things, those inventions are really, really hard. They take a long time. 20 years before they'll right. actually, people will actually be using them. Think of the time, you know, from the time DARPA, our military, invented the internet until the internet actually took off with businesses and consumers. A long time. Yes. The transistor, same thing. You know, it took a long time from Bell Labs, the initial conception, until it was being used in PCs and other devices. So, uh, and, they, and it cost millions of dollars. The problem with most entrepreneurs is they can't invent these core technologies because they're broke. <laughs> they <have no laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. They yes. are broke. <laughs> and, well, unless you're Elon Musk, you know, or who can just raise gobs of money. Uh, you don't have, and he can be a true inventor, right? Of new yeah. parts for rocket ships and all, all the stuff that, you know. How does he do know. it? <laughs> yeah, he's raising so much money and he's a great talker and, you know, and yeah. he's, a, he's an amazing individual. Um, but most of us aren't that. 
um, for many reasons. We have no money. We have barely enough to survive. And we don't have much time. We can't wait 10 years for this right, right. thing to go. You know, we literally have to prove it'll work within a year or we're back at a day job. Yeah. So uh, these are the entrepreneurs I work with. So what <laughs> entrepreneurs do well is what's called innovation. And that's what I write about in my book. It's about innovation. It's how do you... Uh, take a core technology that's out there and actually use it in a new way. So there are all these technologies being, that have been invented, and then there's all these technologies that are constantly being innovated upon. And your goal as an entrepreneur is to take the latest innovations and the latest technologies and see if you can apply them to new business uh, sectors. That is what entrepreneurs do. My, my view of the world is that every time a new technology comes into being, like the internet or the transistor, big technologies, or the, you know, the television, the vacuum tube television set, all, any of these, uh, there's a long period where people don't quite know all the applications right. and people start to figure it out. They start to use it and try it and experiment. Oh, could we do this? Could we do that? And innovate upon it. And, Every time they do, it opens up a new door, and that mm. is the door of opportunity. So uh, we saw, you know, as soon as that door opens, that's when the entrepreneurs rush through, because the first ones through that door in a, a, that focus on a new sector, you know, whether it's medical, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, mining or some other <laughs> sector, they apply that technology, they can gain a huge competitive advantage. And that's where they totally out, you know, a small company with no money <laughs> and, and just, but figuring out how to use this new technology in a new way gives them a, an uneven playing field. So all of a sudden against all the incumbent players, they have this huge advantage and they can come in there and they can totally remake the industry because they can make the economics either, there are two ways that entrepreneurs succeed, succeed through innovation. And there are only two ways. One is they use that technology, that invention and the technology to innovate on it and they apply it to this new business and they use it to make a product that is exponentially better. If their product is incrementally better, just a little better, mm -hmm. they will, the, the competition uh, will, will, it will just catch up in no yeah. time. Yeah. And they won't have enough advantage to steal customers away. Because when you're a customer, you don't want to leave. Like, you, you figured it out. It's work. If it's not broke, don't fix it, you know? Yeah. If, if I'm using an app and it works, I'm not going to switch to another app unless it's, like, 10 times better. Like, it has to be so much better than, you know, Facebook or, or, <laughs> you know, or, or Snap or whatever it is, you know, or Amazon or eBay or whatever I'm using has to be so much better for me to switch, not just a little better. I'll just stick with what I'm using because it works. Right. Um, so either it has to be exponentially better or there's a second way. And that is if it provides a different value, if it does something different that the competition doesn't do. So you can still use the existing app, but now you want to use something new uh, because it does it differently. So Slack is a great example of this. Slack was essentially the same product that's been out there. It's instant messenger, you know, <laughs> as Facebook messenger, all of these, WhatsApp, all of them have already been out there. Why would you use Slack? Well, they, they applied it in a new way to a new business. So now it's doing, uh, it's, it's designed to do something that my other messengers don't do. And that was why people adopted Slack so quickly and it grew like crazy. So that's what entrepreneurs do. They, they look for those uh, use cases where people have this extreme need and they can come in there and fill it. Now, the lone event inventor is a myth for the reasons I just said. If a lone inventor could do it, then most entrepreneurs would just do it. But most of the big inventions of core technologies, the stuff that really changes stuff, things, you know, not innovations, but inventions, those now come out of big research labs mm -hmm. where they spend years and millions and millions of dollars uh, working on this, you know, or they come out of huge companies, you know, you know, you know, biotech companies, Google is spending, you know, they have the money to spend it, Microsoft, Amazon, 
Those companies have money to do core R&D, but mo entrepreneurs simply don't. And loan inventors don't. So if you're a loan inventor, you're probably working on something like a new fishing lure, like <laughs> how to catch fish better. Or the stuff we see on, as seen on TV. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going to invent the next quantum computer. I'm sorry. Right. There's a loan right. inventor who's not going to do it. It's going to require a team of people, funding, research, maybe several research institutions, universities, governments, all of these things will be involved. A lot of times it's international. Everybody's contributing. Right. So, Unless you have an evil lair in your basement. Yes. If you do, if you have an evil Whole lair ball game. And, and you have, you know, <laughs> and, you're evil, and you're an evil genius. You're it's right. a whole other ball game now. <laughs> yeah, then you can do it. Or you're Elon Musk and you can just snap your fingers and people will give you yes. gobs of money and they trust you to like go to Mars. Then you could do it, you know. Magic. <laughs> or Jeff Bezos, you know, he's doing Blue Origin, same thing. Yeah. He has his own money, deep pockets. So that's, yeah. that's the world we live in. And that's what, uh, that's really the difference. That's, that's the landscape for entrepreneurs out there. Yeah, yeah. And and we see that in co-working facilities now where entrepreneurs kind of congregate and really interesting ideas come out of some of those, I think. So, um, okay, so someone's watching this show right now and they have an idea that they'd like to do something with. What really vague advice do you have for that person? <laughs> I have a lot of vague advice, but even more, I have very specific advice. All right, what specific advice? Person out there, you who's watching right now, who wants to do something, do your own startup. Yeah. So the first thing is a big mistake everybody makes when they do a startup is everybody believes that the idea is so important. The oh. idea, I can't do a startup until I have the idea that will change the world. That's what they tell me. I yeah. have to have <laughs> that big idea that I know will change the world. Uh, what we have discovered and, you know, I did three of my own venture funded startups. I, you know, had successes and failures and went through the whole process. I know exactly what entrepreneurs go through. <laughs> I work with startups now here in Silicon Valley and all around the world. We, you know, my company Founder Space has incubators and accelerators all over the world. So I spend all my time working with these entrepreneurs and, and I can see the problems they have. The first problem is they get fixated on an idea. Mm -hmm. or they get fixated on finding the right idea. But let me tell you, the idea you probably will end up with or that you have in your head right now is most likely wrong. <laughs> it's not the idea that will turn you into the next Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg. It is not the right idea. Mm -hmm. Most startups start out in, in one direction and it's not until they change sometimes Sometimes they iterate many, many, many times and the idea gradually morphs. Other times they just have to scrap the idea. They hit a wall and they pivot and they do go a different direction. Other times they do a total restart or several restarts before I see them succeed. Yeah. So if you don't believe me, let me tell you a few examples that you all know of, we, that you all thought, well, those were overnight successes. You know, they, they had the idea and boom, it happened. <laughs> so, you know, Google, we all think, wow, they had, those guys are smart. They knew what the right idea was. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, Google started uh, with not the right idea. Uh, they actually uh, started with the idea of researching academic uh, papers and, and not researching, indexing academic papers academic research papers so that you uh, go online and you could find out which were the most relevant and best academic research papers. The f founders of Google rightly believed that their initial company would be a nonprofit. In other <laughs> words, it would make no money. <laughs> they were doing it. They were grad students. They thought it would be cool to, for the professors to find yeah. all these academic research papers. They may have dreamed of being a professor then. Um, and this would be a great tool for them. <laughs> it, it wasn't, in, in fact, uh, it wasn't until later when they saw other search engines emerging that they suddenly realized, wow, we have, if we applied our algorithms to search, we could do it exponentially better, not incrementally, but like so much better than the competition that we think we could win. Mm -hmm. And they were right. But, you know, they were so doubtful of their ideas. They tried to sell Google 
for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> to <laughs> excite at home. They tried and they got turned down. <laughs> you could imagine if you were the one who turned them down. I could have bought Google for seven hundred fifty thousand oh dollars. I said, That's too expensive. Guys, just keep working on your search engine. <laughs> um, YouTube, another one we all know, right? We all use it. They start out as a video dating site. You know? What? Yes, video dating. We all I know. I didn't know that. We, you know, we, we all know how attractive video dating is. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> and so they had hit a wall. Nothing was happening. And then they found out, wow, we can use our video dating technology to share videos. And it was really sharing videos, which made it the broadcast network. Nobody knew how to share videos. Oh so my God. these little things. So you think you have the idea, right? Or you're going to spend six months thinking of the idea. I'm telling you, stop. Stop right now. The idea doesn't matter. I'll tell you what matters. You're going to do your startup. What matters is your team, who you're working with. So too many founders spend a lot of time trying to do this idea on their own struggling and struggling only when they kind of get exhausted then they're mm -hmm. like now i need to bring on team members <laughs> save <can't>. me <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's to save me yeah. i need help and you know team members don't want to work usually the team member one feel like it's their idea too they want to mm -hmm. be part of the process and by the time you've worked on it six months and put in a hundred thousand dollars or a year or whatever it is you want to give whoever you're bringing on a small piece of your bad idea. <laughs> you want to give them a little piece of, of the idea that you may think might work. They don't want to do that. They want to, no. they'd rather just do their own from scratch. Um, so you have a really hard time finding co-founders mm -hmm. when you start with the idea. What I tell you to do is go for the co-founder first. Mm -hmm. Find the people you think are the most brilliant who have skills that complement your own things that, you, that they can add and, and a different perspective, like they come from a different country or, you know, they think a different mm -hmm. way. They have a different background. They might be engineering your, your, your business head, your, or maybe you're creative and they're very analytical and you can get together with them and together with your co-founders, you can start to come up, not with an idea, but you start with a direction. Mm -hmm. Tell mm -hmm. yourself, I want to go in this direction and begin to explore, begin to figure out what lies there. Now I have these ideas and I know they're probably wrong. So I'm not, who doesn't matter if you came up with the idea, if you're the CEO or if one of your co-founders, or if you, if some, you know, uncle Joe had the idea, it doesn't really matter. You know, Elon Musk didn't come up with the idea for Tesla. <laughs> that was started by other, some, uh, some people he invested in, you know. Travis Kalanick didn't come up with the idea of Uber. That was started by another person. He was an investor. It, you know, uh, coming up with a big idea isn't the important part. <laughs> the important yeah. part is going through the process of figuring out whether this idea will really work, scale and become a big company, and doing it together with your co-founders, and then uh, executing on it, which, which is re not easy. So if right. you get a great team, who's really good, a really good, the ideal teams, and this is what, what you should be working on, is getting the ideal team before you have any ideas or, or just discard your ideas and start over and go get the team and together go in a direction that all of you find fascinating, interesting, so compelling that you're going to go deep. You're not going to go like shallow like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But the only way to break through as a startup is if you go so much deeper than everybody else that all of a sudden you're figuring out stuff that nobody has figured out. And that's mm -hmm. where the innovations happen. That's where the magic happens. That and the team together. And on a team, I wanna see three types of people. So I wanna see an amazing, we call it hustler in Silicon Valley. It means amazing business person. Person yes. who will do anything to get the business, you know, <laughs> they will knock on doors at three in the morning. They'll stalk people. They, you know, they're the type who, who will never sleep. They'll travel around the world to go, you know, pitch at a conference. They'll do whatever it takes. And then you need an amazing, and it's usually not the same person, but sometimes it is like in Mark Zuckerberg, technologist, somebody mm -hmm. who's a hacker, 
He's playing with the latest technology. As we said, it's using the latest technology and innovations, applying them to a new business that makes it happen. If you're not playing with the latest technology every day, you're not going to be able to be really understand how to apply it to a new mm -hmm. business. So you need that person. Those two are magic. If you get those two, you got a business. Now, the third person I like to see uh, is, but is, isn't as important, but still very important, is not a marketing person. <laughs> Marketing people ah. come later when you scale the business because you have no money right. to market at the beginning. You have you, you can't well you get a VP of marketing from Facebook. What are they gonna do, right? <laughs> well, you you have five million dollars, you know, or fifty million, you know what? They're not gonna do anything. Um, uh, so what you need is a great creative designer, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who who understands user experience, design thinking, how to create something that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, because a lot of innovation, especially low cost innovation that startups do happens in design. It doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. It, they're using the latest technology, but it's pretty much the same technology as everybody else. Like I gave the example Slack. Slack is all about design model and business model innovation, right? Mm -hmm. Uber was just an app. And, you know, so it was really business model and design innovation. Airbnb mm -hmm. was just a website, you know, it was, it, but they were designers. So they designed a right. whole new experience for people. They're really, really focused on that. Uh, Dropbox, that had been around for year, years and actually failed. It was called xDrive. Um, <laughs> That's you know, right. I tried it. it was too complicated. Nobody cared. And bandwidth wasn't enough. So, but they came around with Dropbox when the bandwidth limits were higher. Yeah. They had a beautifully simple design, the combination, boom you know, and a, set, a nice, beautiful freemium model, all three of those, you know, Dropbox took off. So those, that's, so those three people, uh, and focus, uh, if you have that, you're set to go, you are set to go. You don't even need me, <laughs> but that, that's a good start. So, so we're going to go into the bonus round now because you said some things. Bonus, that, <laughs> bonus round. <Yeah>, <laughs> I don't know if the internet can handle the two of us together right now. I don't know. <laughs> okay, bonus round. Woo -hoo! All right. So, um, so you, you know, this is a different bonus round, by the way, than the one I was gonna do because really? uh, yes, because you said so many things, and I feel like I want to talk to you so many more times and ask good. you so many more than two questions. Darn it! Why did I have to we'll go do with two like questions? Twenty questions are next. I one. know. Well, That's so. Special. So you, you've talked about building a team and, and on this show, um, I talked to a lot of people about culture. And so the things you've talked about are, are kind of, these are the skill sets that you want in people. But do you think there's a, an important place for culture in the early stages of a startup? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. let me just say, I want to rebrand your show. You know, the show Two and a Half Men. So <laughs> yours will be Two and a Half Questions. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions plus as much as I want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, culture. You know, people talk about culture. So yeah. there are many different types of cultures in startups. There isn't just one type of culture. And I've seen many types of cultures work. Now, there's certain types of cultures that I would want to work in. Yeah. <laughs> there's other types that just work. But God, I wouldn't want to work in those cultures. Yeah. So I travel to Asia a lot. So I go to China all the time. We have offices there for founder space. And uh, in China, the entrepreneurs work like their culture is, I'm the boss and you're working until you drop. <laughs> you know, the, every, the startup founders, they'll work, you know, six, seven days a week. Yeah. And they will work like 12 plus hours a day. Uh, great. Amazing. Sometimes 16 hour days. It's just absolutely nuts. So like I have a friend who just joined a blockchain startup there. She was like, oh man, she, she was like a journalist before. And she goes, it was so easy to be a journalist. Like I'm getting, you know, I have to get to the office in the morning and then I don't leave the office until 11 every oh. night. And I have to work <laughs> six days a week. And then on Sunday I have to do my chores <laughs> just to keep up. And, and he, and she goes and the founders are there too. Everybody's there. Everybody's there. Mm -hmm. So Beijing is the extreme even of China. So there are other cities in China where that's not as bad, mm -hmm. but um, so that's one type of culture. And then, and there's, and, and in most Asian countries, I do a lot in Korea and Japan, you know, what the boss says goes, 
do you have an idea? I'm sorry, I'm the boss. You're doing it my, whatever I say, you do it this way, you know? Yeah. And then we have Silicon Valley culture, which is sort of the antithesis, you know? Yeah. Everybody's, out, you know, oh, oh, my kid has a soccer game. <laughs> <laughs> I have to skip this important meeting because <laughs> the soccer game really matters to my child. <laughs> so that they're off to the soccer game and, you know, weekends I'm turning off my phone, you know, so it's a very different culture. Yeah. Uh, and so of course I'd rather work at Silicon Valley. I do, you know, <laughs> uh, and um, I just, whenever I hear my Chinese friends in China, I'm just, I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> you want quality of life yeah um unless you're the founder and then you're profiting because they don't even give much equity to all the other people in the oh world. wow yeah they give like a tiny bit of equity tiny oh. tiny bit you know <laughs> here we're doling away the equity and you know and all the perks and free lunches and all the stuff so silicon valley is a much more permissive culture mm -hmm. so uh like i said both startups can su succeed you can succeed in having a draconian culture <laughs> if society permits that yeah so employees are always going to gravitate towards uh the best fit for them mm -hmm. but like in a city like beijing where they're all workaholics everybody is working all the time so you feel like it's normal like that's you know if you switch right. to another job you're it's going to be the same thing mm -hmm. in silicon valley you know, we've sort of been upping the ante on like, how much free stuff can we give you? How, you know, can you have ping pong tables and, you know, foosball and all these things. Good for creativity, right? Well, not always. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a limit, right? If you're yeah. playing foosball half the day, I don't know how, you know, if that's actually making you more creative. You know, right, if you're playing right. it to let off some steam, good. Yeah. They have all those tables in China too. Um, they're just stuck in the office and they can't play too much. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they've copied Silicon Valley, like on the surface, like they yeah. look like Silicon Valley offices. They have the ping pong tables and everything. And the lounge there, room. you're just not allowed to use them. <laughs> no, no, you are. But yeah, yeah. But everybody is sitting at their desk, either typing away mm -hmm. or on their lunch break, you'll see them. They're actually sleeping. Uh. <laughs> they are sleeping at their desk, you know. Oh, my gosh. Way overworked. Um, <laughs> my They've done studies in Korea of, you know, Koreans will always stay until their boss leaves and their boss mm. feels like they have to stay until the other boss leaves. And then there's some boss up the ladder who never leaves. Right. Uh. <laughs> so they're all there till 10 at night or whatever. Um, but they aren't more uh, th their efficiency is no higher mm -hmm. because, you know, you can only work so long. Right. And then you start to kind of kill time, right. you know, like, doing stuff that looks like you're working but you're not really getting much done you're slowing down if i have to be here till 10 i'm not yeah take careful. your time i'm not gonna rush through this yeah so you and you end up not being more efficient doing it that way and we proved that silicon valley has been highly effective at launching startups with a much more i consider compassionate sane culture yeah. here now the culture i want to talk about on this bonus question <laughs> is the culture of getting your employees to uh, live the company. That's the hardest yeah. thing. And I hear this complaints from entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. I hear it from entrepreneurs, of course, in China. My employees don't care if I'm not there making them work, they don't work. Well, of <laughs> course, in the type of culture you have, like, hell, I'm not going to be working if you're out of the office. <laughs> um, so, but, um, uh, you know, what you need to understand is that there are different types of roles and different types of jobs. If all your employees are on an assembly line, which is kind of where like the China started and it used to be that way in the US, mm -hmm. then you can micromanage them. You can keep them working like insane hours. And you know, an assembly line is going. You don't have a choice. Yeah. You're gonna be doing whatever you do at the rate that, that that machine shoves the products at you. And in that case, kind of the draconian culture really works well, you know? Yeah. Like, like just keep it's hours that you put in that count because thing, and we're going to manage you very efficiently. We're going to make sure you do everything we tell you just how we tell you. Mm -hmm. But in a creative culture, as you were alluding to, like getting people to be creative, getting them to innovate, getting them to come up with their own ideas. 
uh, you need uh, a totally different type of thing because that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, most people on the job are innovative or, and really push beyond what you, there is expected of them because they feel that the job matters to them intrinsically. Mm -hmm. It matters to who they are. They want to do a good job for themselves, not uh, for because you're giving them a bonus, not because, you know, they believe that the company, you know, all the, the kind of they drank the Kool-Aid <laughs> and they believe that the company is like the, the most incredible thing <laughs> not because of the stock options you gave them, because honestly, there's so many factors. You know, they got this. They don't know like what the stock is really going to be worth until they get the money. Right. They're usually working like crazy. Uh, because they got onto something and they're into it and they have, they own it. Right. But how do you get people to own stuff? And that's the problem. Even in Silicon Valley, a lot of entrepreneurs have because they're like, they own it. They're the co-founder, but how do you get all your employees to feel like as passionately as you do? Right. One way is you have to break off pieces of responsibility mm -hmm. and hand it to them and say, here, this chunk is yours. Now, this is the most important thing about culture of a company. Everything else, all the foosball tables, all the free food, all the, you know, how you decorate your office, those don't even matter. You know, this one piece is what matters. I'm going to hand this to you and I'm not going to tell you what to do because mm. I hired you to do the job. In fact, you know what I'm going to do because I believe in you? I'm going to ask you, mm. what do you think we should do with this? How could, you know, you know our goal. How can we make this just really great? How can we do better with this? Right. Tell me. So I have my rule for creating culture. And so the rule is ask, don't tell. So every time you want to tell your employees, here's this thing. Now go do that. Go do that. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Then you are breaking your culture down. You're breaking uh -huh. it down into you're the one with the ideas and they're the automaton, which just has to do what you say. Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. if you do that, people eventually, if you scold them enough, no, don't do that. Do this. <laughs> they will stop taking chances because, yes. oh, they're going to tell me what to do anyway. And if I try something, they'll probably just get mad that I'm not doing what they told me to do. That and does just... not sound like a place of innovation. <laughs> no. So it's all about every day you go into work, every day you go into work as a manager, yeah. you're saying, uh, what can I ask my employees and not tell them? Yeah. And when you start asking, then all of a sudden you start to get all this valuable information, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they're telling me this and I'm asking, you have to ask really hard questions. And if you know the product should be, the thing should be done a better way, because maybe you have a lot more experience and the person is an intern or, you know, they just don't have the experience. Right. You can ask them, well, have you considered this possibility? Mm -hmm. Why don't you compare w the path you're going down and this path and come back to me with which you think will be better? You know, so you can turn anything into a question, which then puts the responsibility back at them. Oh my God, my boss trusts me and I have to go figure this out. They, ha they, they thought there's another path I didn't see. And so I want to go figure out which is better because I want to do a really good job. And That's a great thing to feel. Yeah, it's a great, you yeah. know, right? You love yeah. it, right? You're yeah. like, totally like, okay, now it's my response. I, and my boss is looking to me for the answer. And, and, and if you do this, not with just your boss, but your coworkers and your co-founders and everybody, you're creating a great culture. That's yeah. it. You can yeah. stop there. Don't worry about what office you have, all that other stuff. No, of course, I don't get to leave until the boss leaves. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's me very neither. sad. <laughs> And my boss is so hardcore. She's so mean. <laughs> when you're your own boss, yes. you're the worst. That's when you really have a, 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 that's when you're really a slave to your company. You, oh my all, gosh. My boss is so hard on me. <laughs> and, and they're always critical of you, right? Your boss yes. like, oh, you're, you're not doing enough. You could be doing more. What are you taking a break for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't be your own boss. That's like the worst punishment you could ever give yourself. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Oh my yeah. gosh. Steve, I could ask you so many more questions. Will you come back? I would love it. <laughs> Yay. Okay, good. All right. Well, in that case, then we'll plan on seeing you again. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All <Take> right. <laughs> Viewers, this is the book. We're going to have a link to Amazon so you can get your book down below in the show notes. All right. Thanks for watching. Thank I'll you. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.